I'm Lucy Wainwright Roach. And I'm Suzzy Roach, her mother. And you're listening to KAOS Olympia, the best radio station in the country. <laughs> Scorpions, beetles, alien ant farm. There's no shortage of insect-themed band names, but for me, it doesn't get any better than the roaches. Hi, I'm Mark Lee Morrison, and today on Low Profile, come for a ride down Interstate 5 with Suzzy Roach and Lucy Wainwright Roach as I talk to them on their way to the next gig on their West Coast tour. Suzzy is one-third of the Roaches, a group of sisters whose records since the 1970s have been creating fanatic enthusiasts around the world, myself included. Her daughter Lucy has released several killer solo records in the last couple decades, and their new album, I Can Still Hear You, is the third that the two of them have made together. This one's an especially big deal for me because I'm a huge fan of the Roaches, and their extended universe, including Lucy and her siblings Rufus and Martha Wainwright, and their dad, Luden Wainwright III. Here's one of my favorite songs by the Roaches, though. It's called Losing True. It's from their album, Keep On Doing. This year, I took my family to see Suzzy and Lucy perform in Seattle a few days before recording this interview while they were on the road. And today we're talking about the Roach's legacy, including being among the first to earn the classification folk punk, Suzzy and Lucy's experience collaborating remotely on an album that was meant to happen in a Nashville studio, their balancing of humor and sincerity in their music and lyrics, the adjustments necessary to incorporate Roach's songs into their set, and Suzzy's most recent novel, The Town Crazy. Because this was recorded on the go, we'll just bear the speakerphone fidelity and enjoy the stories from this exceptional mother-daughter duo. So, uh, I'm speaking to Suzzy and Lucy. Yeah. Y'all are on tour for your most recent album, I Can Still Hear You, right? Yeah, sort of. I mean, we're, we're sort of just rebounding from the pandemic, you know, and uh, trying to go to places where we were supposed to go two years ago, but never did. How's this uh, new version of what you used to do all the time? <laughs> it's, it seems... Uh, Sometimes it's very familiar, and sometimes it seems very new and different. I think everybody's been through a lot. So, you know, I think the audiences are reflecting that. That theme is very present on that record in particular. Yes, well, it, it uh, really was a pandemic record. So we were in the very heavy throes of it in New York City when we made the record. 
Right, and you were recording it remotely eventually? Yeah, we started in Nashville, but then uh, the, the pandemic came and in one day everything was canceled. So we just kind of set up recording uh, studios in our separate houses and, and recorded the rest of it that way. Do you think you still got the record that you had in mind going into it, or did you wind up with uh, something totally different? Interestingly, most of the songs were written pre-pandemic, and we didn't know, obviously, about the pandemic, and somehow they became infused <laughs> with their own pandemic tints. So it seems, I don't know what you would say, but I feel like it seems now like they became what they were meant to be. When I hear it, it reminds me so much of what was happening in New York at that time, simply because we were recording it during that. And it was a real, um, you know, a motivating factor in the midst of all of that to have this project to work on was really helpful. Did you get what you wanted from it production-wise, or do you think you made sacrifices there? I'm not sure what you guys were... Uh planning for in Nashville yeah we were going to go back and forth to Nashville to work on it but it it definitely changed because we couldn't do that and so um, a lot of uh, I spent a lot of time in my apartment playing different instruments and things and also uh, we did it uh, in a studio in New York you know uh, some of the stuff and we also did it out in somebody's house we mixed a lot of it out in somebody's house. Um, so it was really um, seat of the pants. And of course it was a different record than we started out making, but there, there's nothing unusual in that because I think that always happens. Definitely. As, so you mentioned playing multiple instruments and y'all are from a very talented uh, extended family. Um, I'm. Like, how many instruments do y'all play uh, between you, and what's your, uh, what are your favorites? Uh, this is Lucy, and I only play the guitar. <laughs> oh, okay, great. I'm just keeping it as uh, minimal as possible. <laughs> no, that's dedication. I mean, I can, I really only play the guitar too, but in it, it, when it, um, you know, out of necessity, I had to play a lot of different. Uh, you know, parts. I mean, I'm used to sort of hearing different parts, you know, from working on harmonies and stuff like that. So sure. um, I, I can pick things out. And also production wise, I, you know, I, I like to be able to hear the notes that each instrument is playing and, and stuff. So if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be complicated, you know, it just has to have the right notes. And the necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> so you are a mother-daughter duo, and Suzzy, you're most widely known for your trio with your two sisters, uh, the Roaches, with uh, Maggie and Terry, who have sadly passed in recent years. What, what was that, 1979 with the first one? Yeah, yeah. With the three of you? And you, and uh, your sisters had one without you before that. What was that That's all about? You mean, how did that one before the roaches happen? Well, why not Suzzy yet? Oh, well, I was just a kid, you know. I, I was, uh, you know, a teenager. Uh-huh. How much younger are you than them? Oh, you know, 20 years. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm about five years, three years younger than uh, my sister Terry. Okay. But they, they were also young. Um, I made the mistake that a lot of people probably do with that group um, was right off the bat, the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, okay, it's like a, a quirky folk trio. This is, this is cool. And then you slam us with the Hammond song. And it's just like so otherworldly. Come on, you're lying to me. Mm -hmm. 
thanks in no small part to Robert Fripp's guitar playing and production. I, I don't think there was really sounds on a lot of recordings from that time that sounded anything like that. Yeah, I know he, uh, he basically, there was very little production on that, even in, um, you know, he wanted us to sound like we sounded when we were singing live, and we were always a live band. But it's interesting the point you make about, um, you know, we, we had a, always uh, had a funny side to us, and sure. uh, but also were very serious. Uh, and I think it's unusual where it's unusual for people to combine those two things, you know, and as a result, oftentimes when you're, um, you have a sense of humor, people kind of marginalize you for that. Um, but actually that is the way life really is. So uh, it's uh, tragic and funny at the same time. Did you feel like you were pigeonholed as a folk group? Because when I, like, like when I listen to the song Nerds, right, from from the album of the same name, that sounds like something that would have been happening at CBGB's. It's like New York punk to me. Right, well, you know, we were right, um, you know, blocks away from CBGB's, uh, you know. We were sort of, some people were referring to us as folk, I, I mean, <laughs> folk punk. theatrical quality of what we were doing has is many layers not only just musically but um, in the content of it you know it could be taken on many different layers and I think again a complexity is not something that is easily um, understood you know especially now where everything is like a one sentence thing or you know but there are many layers to the way I see it, to what the Roaches did, and also to what Lucy and I are doing. Yeah, and, and Lucy, so you never knew a life where your mom wasn't in a band. You, she was full, yeah. all, all the way in it when you were born. Yeah, definitely. I, I grew up really with the, that, it, it, you know, traveling with them and being um, a lot of the time, so that was a constant always. And at the show I saw recently uh, in Ballard, um, it came up that when you were little, you know, you just assumed you were a part of the band. Yes, I don't remember that, but it sounds kind of annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, kind of surprised at the volume of laughter that came on when you played the Swan Duck song. <laughs> I mean, these lyrics are cute, and they are silly. They are funny, some of them. Um, not, you know, it's a mix, though, of funny and serious. But people at the concert were acting like they were at a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. It really depends on the town. Yeah? Uh, who laughs at what? How much, wouldn't you say? Yeah, sometimes, you know, we don't get a chuckle laughing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And often it happens in our shows. It's like you're playing for your friends, you know. Yeah. Um, like, and I think part of that is because Lucy and I are in the same family, so it's very familiar. And, uh, you know, that kind of translates to the audience. I, I think it's interesting for people to see a mother and a daughter, you know, standing on stage singing songs. It's not that usual. I went to the pond today. Looking for the swan, but the swan had turned into a duck. Tough case, bad luck. What happened to the long, smooth neck? Elegance and grace, bad case. A 
Roach's last album came out about 15 years ago now. As a as a trio, have you thought about that? Um, Listen uh, back to it since then. You know, I really haven't. Um, I tend to not go back and listen to things that much unless I have to relearn them or something. You know, a record is exactly that. It's like a record of a certain time and. Um, We've made so many records at this point. I, it, you know, it's it's like uh, I don't even. It, it's a strange thing, you know, to go over. And each record has its own set of circumstances and people, and you know, so it's almost like once it's over with, it's over with it because you listen to it a million times when you're making it, and right. then you know. You never want to hear it again. <laughs> yeah, and then you continue to make solo records, and uh, you did a couple more with Maggie, right? Yeah, yeah, we just kept going. I mean, there. What's weird is it's a very big body of work, uh, and then of course Lucy has also made a bunch of solo records, and right, that started. Her first one came out the same year as the last Roaches record, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't realize that. Yeah, it was kind of a beginning of a new arc, the transition, I think. Um, yeah, and so Lucy's got, what, eight records out, I think? Yes, well, I put out three solo, uh, you know, full-length records, and then two EPs before that, and one with my sister, that one is um, the top, the, the theme of that record is all um, dark lullabies, so it's mostly cover songs, um, and it was it was definitely an outlier because we just had never worked together before, so it was an interesting collaboration, but it's also a very beautiful record, it really is. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to play something from that right here. Uh, is there a song you think I should go with? Well, one of the darkest songs on it is, is a Richard Thompson song called End of the Rainbow. I like that one a lot. Your mother works so hard to make you happy. But take a look outside the nursery door. There's nothing at the end of the rainbow. There's nothing to grow up Rainbows. Um, your song, Double Rainbow. We just relearned that song, actually. Yeah. Really? Yeah, on Fairy Tale and Myth, that album. Uh, that, I think, is probably before I heard the latest record that you guys did, that was um, hands down my favorite song that you two have done together. And I was wondering if, uh, if, if that's based on a true story or if that's uh, just a narrative and if you want to talk about that song a little bit. Well, it's so interesting that, you know, somebody else was saying that they really liked that song and uh, we relearned it and played it at a concert that they were at. But um, yes, it is. It is a, a situation of a, a couple of stories that uh, collided with each other. Um, what it, when I was a, a tiny child, my parents had a a painter come over to the house and uh, paint each one of the children's portraits mm. and it was a very traumatic experience for me um, because I was so incredibly shy and I could not bear to have somebody paying that much attention to me 
and but it it was a very significant experience for me because I think it was my first interaction with an artist huh. and okay. you know he was very kind and gentle with me and the, the picture that he uh, drew was I was crying in the picture and I still have it actually uh, oh wow when I was just a little kid, a strange guy came to visit. He had a drawing pad. He was a friend of my dad. Ma, come knocking on my door. Somebody's here to paint your picture. I couldn't figure out why. I began. There was something just very deep about that um, experience as a very young child. And I realized that I, I had started thinking about it when I walk, walked through a museum and I saw another painting by someone uh, from India. I forget his name, but he was a schizophrenic um, person who died on the street, but he made this a you know, very exotic painting that really struck me and I, I just started to think about how many um, of my most meaningful experiences in my life have been through art you know one form or another yeah wow and then you took that moment that was immortalized once and immortalized it yet again with more art yeah, they all it all seemed to, to relate. And and you know, I figured that that song was just too obscure to mean anything to anybody else, but um I'm glad to hear that it it uh, meant something to you. Well, I'm just a sucker for storytelling, you know. I yeah. and when you can the the difference between just like a pop song and a song that you know tells a narrative, you know. You've got a real gift for that. Well, you know, I think you just hit on something interesting about our show and uh, Lucy's show by herself and also the Roaches um, shows. I think that the whole thing is based on storytelling. Yeah. And it, it basically the this, this story uh, from the beginning song to the end of the show, it weaves into one story. It's a, maybe a little bit... Um, the narrative may be a little bit uh, circular, but it, it does actually, it's communicating something. Well, um, speaking of storytelling, I just read my first Suzy Roach novel, The Town Crazy. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Man, it's a real page turner. I, I mean, it's just like... Uh, this book, for people who aren't big readers, it's it's kind of like watching TV. It's really engrossing, and you just have to like go to the next episode every time a chapter ends. Um, and yeah, it's it's about a community as in a small town. Um, at the center of it, there's an artist uh, and his child who have um, moved in from the big city. There's a whole bunch of families, and they're all kind of like trying to figure out what's going on with each other there's some some uh behind the back stuff rumors and uh then what i like about it is that it goes from all the adults in the town and you know just like sticking their nose in each other's business and then the side story um which is kind of the i felt like was the main story a lot of the time uh, about the children in the town and yes. See, you, I really wanted to write. I wanted to write children who seemed like real people. Yeah. You know, often children get uh, marginalized in fiction. You know, they barely get mentioned and stuff. But the the children are definitely very um, 
you know, prominent in the book. And I think also that childhood is a very, can be a very frightening journey. Yeah. And because very little is explained to you about what's happening. Well, the kids seem like they, they have the most insight sometimes. Yes, well, I mean, often, I don't know how you felt, but when I was a kid, I felt that I was perceiving an enormous amount, and I just wasn't articulating it that much. Yeah, yep. I, uh... Not like when you were talking about your daughter coming down to the dressing room. Like that experience of her walking down those stairs into the dressing room and seeing those blueberries and asking to have one and having one, that, that had so probably had such a resonance with her that seemed for adults almost like nothing, you know? Yeah, she's going to think about uh, you guys whenever she eats blueberries or, you know, <laughs> whenever she hears your music, she'll get hungry for blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you just don't know. Like, I think it's a great bringing kids to things like concerts. You, I think people try, tend to keep their children away from things that are happening, and it's such a shame because they, if they're right there with you, you know, they're experience, experience, having a rich experience. But that's just me. I mean, as a person who <laughs> Lucy was. Uh, with me a lot, you know, through a lot of things I did. Yeah, um, you know, one specific thing that I really found uh, enjoyable in that book, uh, and it wasn't a big part of the story at all, was just that the kid Felix, which we also have a son named Felix, um, uh, but his his dad just allowed him to paint all over the walls, like whatever <laughs> artwork and stories and stuff he wanted was just covering the walls in their house. And I just, I, I could see myself in there, like, like my, my daughter Lulu, the one who liked the blueberries. If uh, she, she, has, she has drawn on the outside of our duplex across the next door neighbor's door, all the way over to ours. And just like she owns the place, you know. And yeah, well, it's an interesting thing, you know, that character, that little Felix in the story is, you know, he, on one hand, he kind of a considered, you know, a spoiled brat, but on the other hand, he's tortured in his own little life, you know, so it's uh, complicated. Well, uh, yeah. Are, are you in that book? Me? Yeah. Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't, none of those people in that book exist in any shape uh, you know I don't know how I've written two novels I mean it's a very weird thing because you you are imagining these people like you said it, it really is like a movie that book I, I feel like I just was, was sitting there and it was happening visually in front of me you know and I'd be walking around the streets and all these people who don't exist were doing things that they did in the novel. However, at the same time, I think it's in some ways the most autobiographical thing I've ever written. And I can't really explain why that is. I think maybe because childhood is, you know, like shards, you only have shards of memories. And so it's the essence of those memories that you're, you're trying to express you know for me when i was writing that book it was like a lot about the place that i grew up and not a lot about I mean, none of the people who are real or none of the things that happen in the book happened in my town or to me but something about the essence of the book has a lot to do with me yeah. mysterious wow yeah, well, I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to reading your other novel and maybe finding a copy of your kids' book for my little ones. Oh, yeah, right, the, the little kids' book, right. That's, that was a sweet one, too. Yeah. Uh, you ever think about getting into acting again? You did some movies? 
Well, I do work, um, you know, regularly with of um, the Worcester Group in New York City, who is a really a, a world-renowned uh, theater group, avant-garde theater group. And we've, we've traveled all over the world. Oh, you wow. know, I've traveled with them. And um, yeah, so I'm, I do still work with them. And I, as a matter of fact, I'm just about to start a, another piece with them in the fall. So yeah, I do. I, my thing has been to just do say yes to everything. Ah, uh-huh. okay. That's because your secret. I, I feel like if one thing informs the other, really, you know. And I like being around artists, too, so, um, you know, I've been very lucky to have a, a long, uh, steady career of doing the interesting. It's not boring, I'll tell you that. It, sometimes it's <clears throat> a bit harrowing, but uh, it's not boring. Lucy, are you able to keep this lady focused on the music while y'all are touring? Oh, I think she's the more focused one. I, <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's certainly not a problem, but it's just something you can't get sitting at home. Um, and so the show becomes more and more fun the more together it is and the more um, we kind of settle into what we're doing. So that's a nice, we're, we're in a nice place in that way because we've been doing the shows her a little bit here now. She actually has a life as opposed to her mother. <laughs> That's not true. We're all it is got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the mo- most delightful things about traveling with her is that I get to live vicariously. <laughs> yeah. What what all do you have going on these days, Lucy? <laughs> oh, I don't, I'm not sure what she's talking about. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But I do, I bring a lot of podcasts to the table because <laughs> I like to listen to podcasts. So we pass the time uh, that way and there's lots to discuss. And uh, yes, we talk, we, we uh, agree vehemently on certain subjects and we talk about them after we listen to a podcast and then we dissect. On this show, I have had an artist that the Roaches covered. Gretchen Christopher from Fleetwoods uh, Come Softly Oh yeah Yeah, yeah. And we talked that's, about your version She's yeah, a that's sweetheart a beautiful, a beautiful love version Maggie singing that song Yeah And then um, Yeah another guest I have On this same season Steven Steinbrink He does a really beautiful cover of I'd Love to See You uh, maybe I, w- I heard a, a beautiful version of that song. That's one of my favorite songs that I ever wrote. But I don't like the recording that we made of it. It, it wasn't. But I do like. I heard another cover of it, and I do. I, it's a song I I would like to re-record. Actually, you know, my favorite Roaches moment um, in recordings is in one season when it just goes into all those dissonant harmonies it's just like you guys the three of you had like this insane blood harmony thing going throughout all of your records and then you guys somehow just got it to clash on this crazy weird chord (laughs) we go on arguing no one can say Um, sang, you know, the melody uh, against this uh, other melody that that was, you know, what you would call clashing, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, we do that. We do that in our show now too. Y'all are doing that song. Yes, we oh. did. Oh, you missed it because you oh had to Oh my leave. God! I'm so mad. I had to leave early. <laughs> You guys have uh, had to figure out a completely different approach to harmony. It's a very different thing doing two parts uh, than three parts, you know, because you're 
you're not really completing the chord when you're doing two two parts you know you're but when you're doing three parts you must establish a chord so um it just has a different sound to it still got the blood harmony thing that is just, I think, you don't get if you're not related to the person. There's yeah. A, a magic there. Yeah. There are only a couple, you know, a lot of times people ask us if we can, would cover Roach's songs, and um, that's a hard ask because they were so reliant on three parts, and that really made them what they were. But there are some that we've been able to learn and one season is one of them that we have a version of and i'm so glad because that's one of my very favorite songs period not even very favorite roaches songs but just in general as songs go oh me too yeah yeah I can listen to that anytime well i'll have yeah. to catch you again um to hear it live are you gonna do some more solo touring after this <laughs> yeah um I will be uh, kind of planning into the end of the year and next year um, in the spring of 2023 I'll be back out on the road hopefully and um, yeah it's great to be back it's also I you know I, I, I was away for uh, about 200 days a year before the pandemic and um, and then surprised the pandemic I was home for all that time and I think that um, Maybe being gone for 200 days a year is crazy. <laughs> uh huh. You're gonna scale it, back it, a little it, bit. Yeah, it may need some adjustment, but um, I, I'm certainly planning to keep on going. Is it always um, exclusively solo, or have you have you done touring or shows with bands before, like a backup I've really, band? I've only had a backup band when I play in New York solely because of how expensive it, it is to bring people with you. Sure. Um, but I done a lot of touring as an opening act for the indigo girls and that's really fun because then during their show i get to sing in their band which is about as close to a rock band as i'm ever going to be in so <laughs> yeah. um, that's a fun, a fun thing oh wow what's what's your favorite tune to sing with them oh man there are so many songs that i love but one of my favorites is a song called devotion that's one of my favorites to do live with them Are you working on any new records? I'm hoping to to uh, make another solo record, um, at least write it in the rest of this year, hopefully, if I'm lucky, um, and then see what happens after that. Being on the road as much as you say you are, do you find it easier to write on the road? Or like, do, do songs like pop into your head when you're not expecting them? Or do you make a concentrated effort to create a body of work 
Well, this is back with Suzy again. I think I can easily speak for both of us to say that it's impossible to ride on the road. I don't know how anyone can do it, you know. Um, it's uh, Writing seems to be a whole separate thing, you know. It, it, it seems to require solitude and stretches of nothing and, you know, and you're always, it's kind of an act of faith because you never know that if you're going to get something that you like or not. You know, it's similar to writing the novels. You know, the, you don't know what you're doing, really. And you're hoping for the best. I've definitely had songs come to me, like, behind the wheel. And then as soon as I get where I'm going, I just grab a paper plate or something and scratch out what I can uh, what I can yeah, remember of it. But, I've had that also, but usually it's a headset for me, like a how if I'm in a writing period, that happens more often. I don't know why it's like that part of my brain kind of turns off when I'm on the road, you know? Sure. Yeah. Well, we were talking about um, your cover tunes. So It's Not Easy Being Green is on the new record and sung by a famous puppet or a Muppet rather um, are, you, are you a big Kermit guy Suzzy? I like that song I'm very much I've, I've liked it for years and uh, I think it's interesting so many people have covered that song I think it really has struck a nerve in a lot of different people and there's a lot going on in that song that you know of course it's another example of that you know, it's sung by Kermit the Frog, and so it's kind of like a novelty thing, but it has incredible depth to it. And oh, yeah. it's simple, but it's profound. It's not that easy being green, having to spend each day the color of the leaf. When I think it could be nicer being red. Yellow or gold Or something much more colorful Like that It's not that easy being Joe Raposo, who wrote that song I think he He has had Certainly had that gift of You know, again Writing for children To me is one of the most Freeing areas Because you can say a lot more Like for example Um you know, um, E.B. White, you know, who wrote Charlotte's Web. And, yeah. You know, like those books, or or um, Stuart Little, which there's a song on the record that's written for that story. When I read Stuart Little as an adult, I, I was shocked by the depth of sadness that is in that book. And it's a children's book. Yeah. You know? And I feel, again, like sometimes people want to shield their children from those kinds of feelings, but they, you know, children get very sad from time to time. And it's nice to be able to, or they get scared or they get, you know, confused or whatever. And, and I think it's a very fertile place to, uh, to write for children. It's true, and you know, I don't, I don't really think of that as a novelty song. It's got volumes to speak. Yeah, and it's very, it's very soulful, and and kind of, it's a lonely thought um, that you know someone is having when they're sitting by themselves. When green is all there is to be. It could make you wonder why But why wonder, why wonder I am green and it'll do fine It's beautiful and I think it's what I want to be I wanted to play for the listener the title track from I Can Still Hear You But before I do that maybe a few words from Lucy on the song? Sure. Um, that song was the one song that I wrote um, on my, by myself on the record, and um, I wrote it 
right in the middle of when New York was totally shut down those first couple of weeks when the pandemic started. And honestly, when I wrote it, I thought it wasn't really much of anything and we might not be able to use it, but it turned out to be fitting for the whole project. Did you write that kind of after the rest of the album was already written? Yes. Um, it was it was probably the last song that got written for the record, yeah. From all of the people Below and above To all of the things we need to be careful of From that was a near miss To where do I sign this I can still hear you When you are making a record, you're not really sure what your what the end is going to be until it's over, and then you say, "Oh, I see what this is about." You know, kind of like a a photograph coming into itself in a dark room. You know. Yeah. It sort of presents itself to you. It's the final reward. I just wanted to mention I really enjoyed the uh, the deep cut Beach Boys song that you chose. Uh, Day in the Life of a Tree that you did with Maggie um, not that long ago. Yeah, yeah. That's a strange song. It but is. it's also it's also a very uh, you know, deep song. Yeah. It's it's a very um it's like kind of a disarming tune. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. You know, the Beach Boys, when I was a young person, I didn't realize the the brilliance of it. Again, I thought, oh, they're just like a surfer band. But no, they are brilliant. That the, you know, musically and the songs, I, I think it's, they're amazing. Yeah, the stuff that they were doing when the Roaches were starting out, I feel like, you know, it was kind of kindred spirits in some ways. Yeah, well, they had that family thing going on, for sure. Is there anything you guys are looking forward to um, about getting back home after this tour? It's always fun to get back home until you get to New York and remember that you're in New York. <laughs> and it's summer <laughs> and it's hot and it's not as... Uh, we really, you know, we were in Ballard. We were really struck by the beauty up in the Pacific Northwest and it was a real literal breath of fresh air for us to be there for a few days yeah i was so glad that y'all got to come visit this area and kind of kind of at one of the nicer times of the year if you don't mind a little rain oh it, it was just 
breathtakingly beautiful. Well, it's been a real honor to have you guys on, and uh, thank you for giving me some of your time. Thank you for having us on and, and for bringing your family to our show. Yeah, it was great to meet all of you. Yeah, well, break a leg, y'all. All right. Be safe on the grapevine. All right. Bye. Bye. Markley Morrison here, and you've been listening to Low Profile. We just heard my interview with Suzzy Roach of the vocal group The Roaches and her daughter and collaborator, Lucy Wainwright Roach. If you'd like to find more of their work, you can find some relevant links on this episode's page at lowprofilepodcast.com and most good record shops, too. Next time on Low Profile, I'll be sharing my interview with the Oakland-based artist Steven Steinbrink, recorded almost a year ago. I'm going to play you out on his cover of the Roaches' song, I'd Love to See You, mentioned earlier in today's show. Hope you like it, and catch you next time. still